Hi, attendees who are just starting to join us. Um, we are gonna give it just a couple minutes because we've got a bunch of folks joining us tonight. Um, so probably around 5.03-ish we'll get started. But thank you for joining us tonight. While we're waiting for folks to join, um, I just want to draw everybody's attention to the bottom bar in their Zoom window who's attending the webinar. You should see a box down there that says Q&A. And if you click it, it should give you the option to log a question. And so we're going to have a big open session at the end where we're going to take questions from the audience, but you can be submitting those throughout the course of the webinar today. So if you haven't used Zoom webinars before, that's how it works. Um, some folks, our team of lawyers, may want to jump in and answer questions in advance. Um, but for the majority of your questions, we will try to make time so we can answer all of them um, in person. All right, looks like we've got some more folks trickling in just about another minute or so. All right, so um, I think that we will get started here in a minute. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Kristen Gunther. I work for the Wyoming Outdoor Council. I'm so excited to welcome you to our first ever NEPA webinar. Um, and I'm gonna start with an apology because um, true to form for a conservation advocate in the first sentence of my presentation tonight, I have used an acronym and I would like to apologize for that. NEPA stands for the National Environmental Policy Act. It's a law that's 50 years old this year. Um, and it has a bit of a reputation for being a dry and dull topic. But when you get past the thousands of pages of paperwork involved in NEPA, it's actually a pretty incredible law. Um, and it's a legal tool that puts important power in the hands of the people. Um, so why are we doing this little variety show? Um, and it's because NEPA is actually absolutely key to protecting transparency, giving you the right to know what your government is up to and why they're making the decisions that they're making, and giving the public the chance to provide input on a range of projects that affect conservation and the environment, including the management and development of public lands, which is very relevant for a lot of us on this call. The review process created by NEPA, and I promise I'm going to try to limit my acronyms for the entire evening, but NEPA, um, provides an opportunity for you to be involved in the federal agency decision-making process. It'll help you understand what the federal agency is proposing, offer your thoughts on alternative ways for the agency to approach an issue or problem, and to offer your comments on the environmental effects of a federal agency's pro proposed actions, or possible mitigation of potential harmful effects of those act actions. Um, NEPA requires our federal agencies to consider environmental effects that include, among other things, impacts on social and cultural and economic resources, as well as natural resources. Citizens often have val valuable information about places and resources that they value and the potential environmental, social, and economic effects that proposed actions might have on those places and resources. And so NEPA, what it really does is its requirements give you the means to work with agencies so they can take your information into account. Um, but it's complicated. And frankly, it's really confusing and it can be very dry at times. 
Um, and so enter us, the Wyoming Outdoor Council, at which I am a program staffer, and you're going to meet, if you haven't met before, a number of our other staffers tonight. We're hoping that over the next hour, we can have a little bit of fun with this topic and hopefully give you some more information that'll help you hold your government accountable and stand up for the conservation values that people in our state hold dear. Now, along the way, as we go through the program tonight, you're probably gonna have questions. Um, those questions might be about NEBA. They might be about some of the puppets and costumes that you see, um, really anything is fair game. Um, but I just wanna draw your attention to, if you haven't seen it yet, the little Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So that's where we're gonna want you to drop questions throughout the session. And we will make sure that we get to questions at the very end. Um, but along the way, if there's something that's really urgent, one of us might be able to jump in there and give an answer as well. So um, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking tonight about the hows of NEPA, like how it actually works and what happens when. Um, but in order to know the hows of NEPA, you kind of also have to know the whys of NEPA and where it came from. So where the heck did this all important law come from? And to answer that question, I'd like to introduce you to a WAC lawyer, John Rader, and he's going to tell you a little story. <laughs> Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I was just thumbing through this environmental impact statement, courtesy of the National Environmental Policy Act. Oh, you've heard of it and you're intrigued by its backstory? Well, allow me to tell you the tale. Long, long ago, in a time before webinars and Zoom, America's environment was not in great shape. In the 1950s, children played in clouds of dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane, yum, also known as DDT. Here we see children running behind a truck spraying DDT. Look out! Here we see children being deloused with DDT. DDT is a synthetic insecticide intended to kill mosquitoes. Exposure in humans can cause lymphoma, leukemia, and pancreatic cancer. It is very persistent in the environment, travels long distances in the atmosphere, and concentrates inside of animals. But in the 1950s, we didn't know this because we didn't have the National Environmental Policy Act or what we call NEPA. So we sprayed DDT willy-nilly all over the land. In 1962, Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring about the widespread use of pesticides like DDT and the harms they cause. This prompted the American, American environmental movement and a new consciousness about the risk of the fancy industrial tools we developed during World War II. As you may recall from the FM radio hit, Summer of 69, those days were the best days of songwriter Brian Adams' life. But elsewhere that year, things were not going swimmingly. In fact, nothing was swimming between Akron and Cleveland, Ohio, because the Cuyahoga River was on fire, and not for the first time. The river, one of the most polluted rivers in the United States, caught fire 13 times between 1868 and 1969 because of widespread dumping of oil, trash, and industrial waste directly into the water. Here we see the flames swallowing a boat. Hmm, thought some forward-thinking Americans. Perhaps we should consider the impacts of development before making irretrievable and irreversible commitments of resources. The following year, on January 1st, 1970, Congress passed the Not Everyone Prefers Acronyms, excuse me, the National Environmental Policy Act. It was signed into law by that late great environmentalist, President Richard Milhouse Nixon, who, under the intense scrutiny of an engaged public, did the right thing. The ambitious preamble reads, to declare national policy, which will encourage productive and enjoyable harmony between man and his environment, to promote efforts which will prevent or eliminate damage to the environment and biosphere, and stimulate the health and welfare of man, to enrich the understanding of the ecological systems and natural resources important to the nation, and to establish a council on environmental quality. And what these lofty words mean is that the federal government must consider the environmental impacts of its actions before it acts. Look before you leap, if you will. Before NEPA, federal facilities were one of America's worst polluters. The government could clear cut a forest or build a super jet airport in the Everglades without even considering the risk. A report from the National Academy of Sciences supporting the passage of NEPA put it thus, we live in a period of social and technological revolution in which man's ability to manipulate the processes of nature for his own economic and social purposes is increasing at a rate which his forebears would find frightening. The effects on man himself 
of the changes he has wrought in the balance of these great natural forces are but dimly perceived and not well understood. If divergent lines of progress are seen to give rise to ever greater stresses and strains too fast to be resolved after they have risen and been perceived, then obviously the intelligent and rational thing to do is to learn to anticipate those untoward developments before they arise. And that, my friends, is the origin and the purpose of NEPA, to think before we act and to be intentional with how we use our resources so that our eagerness for development doesn't outpace our respect for the environment. Wow, John, that was pretty great, pretty inspiring content. Um, you know, you're pretty great at this NEPA stuff. Uh, for those of you who don't know John, um, he's actually one of three lawyers that we have on our staff. Um, the others including Dan Heilig, who is a senior conservation advocate, and Lisa McGee, who is our executive director. So we actually have a team of three lawyers on the Outdoor Council staff. And John, I wonder if you're good enough at NEPA, not just to tell a good story about it, but to beat all the other lawyers at trivia. <laughs> team. Thanks for joining me this evening for a rousing game of NEPA trivia. A very complicated but also delightfully fun game. Um, so I'm going to be picking all of your brains tonight. You're all kind of in the hot seat at the same time here. Um, and we're just going to see how well you guys know the history and the implementation. Uh oh, we might have lost Dan. Um, the history and implementation of NEPA. Do we still have Dan? Yeah, I'm here, sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. It wouldn't be a game show without some technical difficulties. Um, all right, well, it's good to see everybody and here's how the game is gonna work. So um, in this segment, we're gonna pit all three of you against each other and we'll see who's the ultimate NEPA champion, like who really knows the most about NEPA. Um, but to keep things a little bit interesting for our attendees who are watching, um, we are actually gonna have each one of you playing for a different um, Zoom webinar attendee. So, John Rader will be playing for Penny Maldonado. These folks were randomly selected uh, before the start of the webinar. Lisa McGee will be playing for Margie Brown. And Dan Heilig is playing for Linda Ollinger. So, get familiar with those names. Folks, if you heard your name, feel free to cheer people on directly because they, they, uh, they have your fate in their hands. And at stake tonight, um, we have a gift membership to the Outdoor Council for the person who wins. You will also get a copy of the new Citizens for the Red Desert, Northern Red Desert map. And your choice of either an Outdoor Council sweatshirt, which is pretty cool, or t-shirt, depending on what your preference is. Um, although given how this quote unquote summer has been going, I might go with a sweatshirt if I was you, but it's in your hands. Um, all right, so what we're gonna do, how the game works, is we are gonna alternate lawyers with these trivia questions. Um, and I will go between the three lawyers. And if you miss a question, I'll go to the next person in order to see if they get it right and they can steal the point. Um, and if they miss it, it goes to the third person. If nobody gets it, then we'll have a brief conference about that after the, <laughs> after the, after the game. All right. So, John Rader, you are going to be playing up first, and your question, this is a multiple choice question. So, which U.S. president originally opposed NEPA? Was it A, Richard Nixon, B, Ronald Reagan, C, Jimmy Carter, or D, no president has ever opposed NEPA? Hmm. I'm not certain, but I'm going to go with Richard Nixon. That is correct. Um, the political tide that brought Nixon to support NEPA did not actually start to turn until a three-day hearing in the spring of 1969, and that included witnesses like Margaret Mead and Dave Brower that were part of that hearing and started to shift the needle um, on Richard Nixon's ultimate support of NEPA. Great, so that's one point, and we do have um, one person. Oh, I see Margie Brown has weighed in, Team Lisa, so Lisa. Keep that, keep that in your heart. 
Um, okay, so question for Lisa. This is not multiple choice. Um, who was NEPA's main legislative sponsor? It's not multiple choice. Not multiple choice. <coughs> I can make it multiple choice. Can I phone a friend? Who is, yeah. is the friend Dan Heilig? Yes, the friend is Dan Heilig. Well, Dan Heilig would be able to steal the point if he can answer it faster. I do Lisa, not answer. Are you throwing me a lifeline? I, I mean, I don't, I'm so sorry, Margie. Um, okay, so 1970 or in the late 60s, the legislative sponsor. I think I could take a shot at that. Born, but I understand. Uh, yeah, go for it, Dan. I believe it was Henry Jackson. Ding, ding, ding. It was Henry Jackson. All right, a point on the board. Partial credit for that does go, it's a little bit confusing because partial credit does go to senators, Senator Muskie um, and Congressman John Dingell and George Miller. So there's actually, I mean, there's a whole crew of people that were involved, but um, the main legislative sponsor was Henry Jackson. Okay. Oh, John, what was that? Are there any bonus points for his nickname? Oh, there could be. What's his nickname? That Henry Scoop Jackson. <laughs> I'm gonna have to fact check that later, but I'm happy to. I'm happy to throw in a point. Um, all right. So moving on, Dan. Let's see if you can keep this going. This is a true or false question. Okay. So, Dan, true or false? The House vote on NEPA in 1969 was unanimously in favor of passing the law. Is that true or false? Well, it's hard to imagine anything passing unanimously today. I I'm going to say true. What the heck? I have no idea, but I'll guess true. No, um, it's actually false, but this was a very tricky question because the Senate vote was unanimous. The okay. House vote was not. That's, so that's it is a, hard to imagine things being unanimous in this day and age, but apparently yeah. the entire Senate in 1969 felt like NEPA was a pretty good idea. So That's great. Good cool. question. Um, all right, so after one round, we have Dan and John tied at one. Dan, you got that point uh, for knowing the sponsor. All right, so round two. John Rader, it's back to you. What and when was the first legislative attempt at something like NEPA? Now, this is a multiple choice question. Um, so A, was it in 1963 with the passage of the Clean Air Act? B, in 1970, with the establishment of the Congressional Research Service? Or C, was it 1959 with the introduction of the Resources and Conservation Act? C, the 1959 Resources and Conservation Act. Correct, that is correct. The first shot at doing something like NEPA. All right, Lisa, question number two, second round. So NEPA has two purposes, often referred to as twin purposes. Um, one is considering every possible environmental impact from a project. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but basically. Um, which of the following is the second of NEPA's twin purposes? So is it A, to ensure the agency will inform the public that it has indeed made the best possible environmental decision? Is it B, to ensure that the agency will inform the public that it has indeed considered environmental concerns in its decision-making process? Or is it C, to ensure that the agency does not take any action without consulting with public stakeholders? I can repeat that. It's a lot of words in there, so I can repeat them. Right. I think it's B, but can you repeat that? I'm just going to tell you it's B. You nailed All it. Right. Great. Okay, yeah. um, it's to ensure that the agency will inform the public that it has indeed considered environmental concerns in its decision making process. So that is the second of the twin purposes. All right. Got a point for Margie. Way to go. I'd love for her to get a sweatshirt. <laughs> um, okay. Question number six. We're going to get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts of NEPA. Um, so, Dan Heilig, in 60 seconds or less, can you describe what is a scoping period and why does it matter? A scoping period is when the agency reaches out to the public uh, for their views, input, information, et cetera, on the proposed action. So, 
agencies will, if they're, if they're preparing an EIS or sometimes even an EA, sorry for the use of acronyms, they'll send a notice out, uh, it'll be published in a newspaper and online these days and asking the public if they have any concerns or information about a particular area or particular project, particular resource. Uh, so it's a, a period in the, the early period in the NEPA process where the agency collects information about resources and potential impacts, uh, alternatives uh, that may be available um, for a particular proposal. Awesome. Yep. I'm going to give you a point for describing that and managing too, which is very hard with anything NEPA, doing it in 60 seconds or less. So that in itself, I feel like is worth a point. But that's, a, that's a first for me to say something in under 60 seconds. <laughs> well, at the end of the second round, we have two more rounds to go. We have John and Dan tied with two, Lisa um, with one point, but real close to the lead there. So um, let's get, it, get to question number seven. John Rader, again, 60 seconds or less on this topic. What does CEQ stand for? What does it do? CEQ is the Council of Environmental Quality, and they advise the president on environmental issues. Uh, they also promulgate regulations that interpret NEPA. NEPA um, is a really ambitious document, but it's also a very short statute, and so it needs a lot of regulations to interpret it. Cool. Um, technically, it's the Council on Environmental Quality, I believe, but I'm going to give you the point. It's fine. We're not playing that kind of a game. So, um, but good work explaining the Council on Environmental Quality. Um, Lisa, question for you. Uh, again, same, same sideboards apply. Um, please try to keep it 60 seconds or less if possible. Um, what is a categorical exclusion and when can a project receive a categorical exclusion? Give at least one example if you can. Okay. So a categorical exclusion um, is kind of a, a pass for a group of projects that the agency has determined um, doesn't have any significant impacts. So for example, mowing the lawn around a visitor center in a national park. Certainly there are, one could argue, some impacts, but uh, they have been determined by the agency um, to not be significant. And so you don't need to do an environmental assessment. Certainly you don't need to do an EIS. Um, you get this kind of um, pass from, from doing those analyses. Cool. Short and sweet. Good work. All right, Dan. Um, jumping off that last question, in the event that a categorical exclusion cannot be applied to the action an agency wishes to take, what does the agency do next? And this is multiple choice. Um, so if you can't get a categorical exclusion, do you A, go through an environmental assessment, also known as an EA? B, do you go through an environmental impact statement, also known as an EIS? Or C, do you create a schedule of public meetings to discuss the issue with stakeholders? I think this is a trick question. But I, I, I think that uh, in some cases, all three answers would, would be correct. Uh, an, an agency can automatically jump into the preparation of an EIS that has sufficient information indicating that the impacts may be significant. If it's a close call or if it doesn't know, it could pre prepare an EA, an environmental assessment, which is designed to uh, uh, disclose whether or not a federal action proposal, uh, a policy plan, et cetera, uh, may have significant environmental effects. And certainly they can hold meetings at any time to gather public input about uh, anything they, they're interested in. So was that designed to be a trick question? It was not actually. I was looking for environmental assessment, um, but true to form, you are such an expert in this topic area um, that you actually have a more correct answer than what I had. Um, so what I was looking for was an environmental assessment, um, but all of that makes sense. So um, okay. look for Dan um, for being more correct than my questions cheat. Um, all right, that's good. Now we're headed into the final round. Um, and so, again, score still, John and Dan still tied, Lisa just one point behind, so anything could happen in this final round. 
All right, John, when does an agency have to write an environmental impact statement as opposed to an environmental assessment? What is the difference between those two things? Dan just hinted at it a little bit. Yeah, uh, an environmental impact statement or an EIS is a much more comprehensive document. And it's required when there's a major federal action significantly affecting the human environment, which uh, the agency may discover through an environmental assessment. They might make a determination of finding of no significant impact. And if they do, they can stick with the EA. If there is a significant impact, they have to proceed to an EIS. So it's like a precursor step, right? getting making you decide whether or not you're going to get to an environmental impact statement if you have to go through that higher more rigorous level of analysis right that's right and except with the caveat that dan pointed out that an agency could proceed directly to an eis if there was evidence of significant impact always a caveat with nepa um, but that is correct um not shockingly <laughs> Um, so for those of you who don't know, Dan, or not Dan, well, Dan and John spend a lot of their time looking at EISs, draft EISs, and EAs, so. Um, okay, and then uh, moving on to Lisa. What is the minimum, minimum comment period for a draft environmental impact statement? I believe it's 45 days. Ding, 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 that is correct. Great, not super rusty. All right. Final question of the game, Dan Heilig. Let's see how this shakes out. In ed any agency's NEPA documents, what alternative must always be considered? Please explain. Well, I believe the answer is the no action alternative. Maybe question. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, the proposed action would also have to be considered because that's the whole point to disclose the impacts from the proposal. So um, the no action is uh, required in, in every NEPA analysis, whether it's EA or EIS, and uh, it's kind of meant to be a baseline, uh, I suppose, uh, so that impacts can be viewed against uh, the existing condition. So I'll just leave it at that. I don't want to get myself uh, in a hole here and have points removed from the table. <laughs> well, with that, um, John and Dan did tie today. And so I actually think what that means is that we have two winners. Um, that means that both Linda and Penny are gonna receive a walk sweatshirt, a map, and a gift membership according right. to the rules of the game. Um, and now, you know, I, I think that was a really great um, trivia game. First of all, Dan Heilig, thank you for your participation this evening. I'm gonna keep Lisa and John on the hot seat here because we're gonna answer some audience questions. Um, but thank you, Dan, for being a great contestant tonight. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it. Have fun in the next segment. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. So let's reset a little bit, because actually a lot of information came out of that trivia game. Um, but, you know, I personally have a lot of follow-up questions. Um, and I think it's probably good if we just spend some time sitting and chatting and thinking a little bit um, more about you know, NEPA and what it means to us and how it works. And so as a reminder, folks, if you want to keep putting questions in that Q&A box, um, that will allow us to see those and we can start getting to those. So we're going to start taking some audience questions um, and we'll get ready to answer those live. But it, hey, it actually looks like we have a caller, which I didn't expect. Oh, it's Belinda the snail. Belinda, yes, thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, Belinda, do you, what, what, what's your question for our, for our lawyers? Yes, thank you. I was just wondering, please, what's the difference between NEPA and the EPA? Is one involved with the other? That's a great question, Belinda. They sound very similar, but um, in addition to the capital N being a difference, uh, NEPA, we've talked about a little bit already. It is the, uh, the act that requires agencies to look at the potential environmental consequences of their actions, inform the public, and solicit public input. Uh, the EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency, so they're an executive agency, and uh, they are the agency that uh, regulates and enforces acts like the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and other fun acronyms like CERCLA and TSCA and RICRA that you can look up at home. Interesting, so interesting. Where can I find the 
documents that agencies are looking at while they go through these analyses processes? Another fantastic question, Belinda. Um, there are, uh, we, we mostly work with uh, the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management here in Wyoming. Those are kind of our key public lands management agencies. Uh, the BLM has a website called ePlanning where they list all of their NEPA projects. Uh, the Forest Service also has a website that kind of aggregates all the projects across all the national forests. But if you um, look at the individual forest website, like for the Shoshone or the Bridger Teton, they'll outline all the projects uh, in that forest on, on their website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know. That's all, that's all said and good. But, you know, once you find they're also hard to understand. I mean, there's so much legalese, all these technical terms. And don't get me even started on the acronyms. EPA, NEPA, EA, DEIS, EIS, CE, ABCD, XYZ. How is a simple working class moose like myself supposed to understand what, the, what this all means? Like, why do, how do I even know what the government's up to? Mr. Muse, Moose Q t taxpayer, we, we hear you. It's complicated, isn't it? Um, but there's some tips. Certainly, if you get your hands on an environmental impact statement, that big document, there is always a glossary and a list of what the acronyms mean. However, if you don't really have the time to look at those documents yourself, our recommendation is that you become a member of a conservation group tracking the issues that you care about and we will do that work for you and on your behalf. So for example, the Wyoming Outdoor Council, we like to say that we read EISs, so people like you and moose like you and snails don't have to. I will drop a link over here in the Q&A or the chat about a way that you can get on the, the mailing list of the Outdoor Council um, and we'll do a lot of that hard work and waiting through acronyms for you. I appreciate that. I spend a lot of time on the internet, so that's perfect. Perfect. I have a follow-up question, please. Um, sure, Linda. Thank you. How does the public get involved in a NEPA process? Oh, that's a good question, too. You know, you want to figure out who the lead agency is. So for example, if you hear about a project happening on uh, the BLM land near, near your house um, or a national forest, you can reach out to that agency and ask to be put on a mailing list so that you will either get mail or an email about um, the process and when uh, there are opportunities for you to submit comments and also for public meetings, open houses or hearings that you can attend and ask questions and raise your concerns. And then again, like I was telling Moose Q, you can also become a member of a conservation group following some of these issues and, and we will let you know about important meetings and deadlines so that you don't miss them. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, it, it seems like all this public analysis takes forever. Maybe we make it more efficient somehow? I mean, do we really need all this public comment? That's fair. You know, these public comment periods, uh, they can last a while. The NEPA process can last a while. Um, a couple points. You know, sometimes it takes time to do things right, and it's worth the time on the front end to prevent environmental impacts that might last for a generation. So it really is important that we look at the consequences of our actions before we take them. But another important point is that it's often not public comment periods that are causing the delay. You know, those time periods are set by regulation, and so they're, they're kind of constrained. Uh, but delays can be caused by changes in federal policy when we change administrations. They can be caused by holdups with the operator or by uh, holdups with cooperators like state agencies or other actors that may be working in the process. And an example is the Rock Springs Resource Management Plan down in Southwest Wyoming. This is a plan that's going to set the policy for 3.6 million acres of public land. Um, we've had about nine years of delay since the last time the pub public was able to weigh in back in 2011. 
And so that's all delay that didn't have anything to do with public input. Uh, that was all cooperator meetings behind closed doors. And so, you know, the argument that we need to streamline NEPA, often that comes at the cost of public input and public process. And, uh, and we would argue that that's, that's vitally important. Yeah, so when does the public get to learn about the projects through NEPA? Who gets to be in the room during the planning process? Well, that's a great question too. Um, most of the time, the public is invited to all of the meetings where projects are being discussed. Um, that was certainly the case when a lot of us worked on the Shoshone National Forest, which was a 10 year process. And Forest Service not only opened its meetings to the public, but also invited local government agencies, um, state agencies, county commissioners, and everyone um, got to hear what was being discussed. And there was a chance um, during the meetings for the public to provide comments. That's not the case though with how the Bureau of Land Management runs its meetings with local governments. John, do you wanna explain what's happening there? Sure thing, Lisa. Yeah, the example I just brought up earlier with the Rock Springs RMP, uh, those meetings have not been open to the public. So we've had um, state agencies, local governments, and the federal government meeting um, and discussing the future of our public lands for the past nine years without any public involvement. So that's a, a stark contrast to the Forest Service. So uh, does this NEPA deal, does it force the government project to be more, you know, environmentally friendly? Because if it doesn't, then what's the point? Right. You know, it is often um, explained as a procedural statute, but in fact, the way it works and when it works best, um, often better decisions are made in the end. Um, it doesn't force an agency to pick the most environmentally friendly alternative, um, but it does require um, all relevant information, the best available science, it uh, requires public in, um, participation and information that the public brings to be considered. And so often as a result of, of that process, um, the agency makes the most informed decision. And often that decision is one that is more sensitive uh, to the environment than it would have been without the process. So it really does cultivate or create a, a situation where better projects result. Okay, but you know, again, with the caveat that I'm a hardworking American moose, you know, what do, what do I need to, why do I need to care about this? And you know, what good has it ever done for me personally? Or what good's it done for Wyoming? There are lots of examples right here in our backyard. Um, and NEPA, NEPA can really help protect wildlife like moose and other resources. You know, in 2004, private landowners near the Clark's Fork of the Yellowstone River, which is the state's first designated wild and scenic river, they noted that the environmental review of a proposed seismic survey failed to consider the impacts of the explosive charges they were going to use to create a 3D image of resources. And uh, those were going to impact water resources and elk, other game species, uh, hunting opportunities, Native American historical sites, and private property values. But the public input on the seismic survey led the BLM to re-examine the draft plan, consider the use of new survey technology, and mitigate the damaging impacts from the explosive charges. It can also help the public better enjoy our lands. For instance, open communication with the Wyoming public during the NEPA process for the Bridger Teton uh, helped establish the off-highway vehicle system back in 2009. And the plan addressed concerns from local business owners, from citizens, and environmental organizations to reduce conflict between multiple users. And NEPA can even proactively address the concerns of private landowners. So there was a recent vegetation management project in the Bighorn National Forest and it was intended to reduce hazardous fuels through cutting and through prescribed burns. But through the NEPA process, adjacent landowners raised concerns about increased public access to their lands and the potential for trespassers, and the Forest Service listened. They incorporated design elements into the project to address the issues, 
and they erected gates at key access points, things like that. Wow. So what are some okay. ongoing projects that we Wyomingites should know about? Oh, there's, there's no shortage of projects uh, being considered right now. Um, what, you know, certain kinds of projects, the Wyoming Outdoor Council and other groups uh, track all year round, and that is the quarterly oil and gas lease sales that happen on the public lands um, and with pub public minerals um, across the state. And so every time there's an offering of oil and gas leases, the BLM is required to look at the impacts of what development on those parcels would look like. And so folks like John and Dan are doing that work, um, looking at um, individual parcels, perhaps, and I've, we've seen this in the last couple of years, um, parcels proposed for lease sale are uh, right in the middle of some of the best sage grouse habitat in the state or in the middle of the world's longest migration, mule deer migration corridor. And so our role is really to say, actually leasing in those parcels is a terrible idea um, and, and hopefully influence uh, the agency to make a different decision. Um, but the agencies are required to look at the impacts um, of, of those decisions. Thank you, very informative. John. Thank you, John and Lisa. I'm inspired to go submit some uh, public scoping comments for my for my next uh, neighborhood NEPA process. <laughs> oh well, you're welcome, uh, Moose and and Belinda. Um, I feel like I cut John off. There's a couple other NEPA processes that we're tracking as an organization um, that are important to mention. I did want to mention again the, the Rock Springs RMP. This is something I brought up earlier. Um, it's still being, the area is still being managed under the, the 1997 Green River Management Plan. Uh, and it's undergoing a big revision that we expect a draft to come out in July. Uh, and this will set the management priorities for again, 3.6 million acres of public land in Wyoming, possibly for the next you know, couple of decades. And there's some really incredible resources out there. The Rock Springs Field Office is home to the Red Desert, to the Red Desert, to Hoback Mule Deer Migration Corridor, uh, the Steamboat Mountain Desert Elk Herd, uh, many tribal cultural properties and sacred sites, cultural resources. It's a really incredible landscape that deserves a lot of attention from the public. Uh, we're also following the Wyoming Pipeline Corridor Initiative. And this is a more recent proposal to connect existing oil and gas fields for enhanced oil recovery and uh, carbon capture and sequestration. And uh, it would establish a right-of-way for these pipelines, about 2,000 miles of right-of-way across the state. And we are uh, reviewing that to look at the siting of that, to look at the, the purpose and the need, all these other things that the National Environmental Policy Act requires. And that's another uh, large-scale project that deserves your attention. Well, thank you to Belinda and to uh, Moose Q. We had a comment from Jocelyn Moore in the chat that she thought that Belinda and Moose Q raised some really excellent issues and I couldn't agree more. Um, these are questions that all of us have had at one point or another. So thank you to Belinda and to our friend Moose um, for joining us today and asking all these questions. Thank you. Thank you for not screening my call like everyone else. <laughs> Well, with that, um, it's not to not to say that uh, I'm screening everyone because we're in webinar format. Um, but what we're going to do now is go ahead and go to um, the. Let me just switch something real quick. Do. Um, okay, so what we're going to do now is um, switch to uh, looking at questions that you have all submitted. Course of this um, so what I'm going to start with is actually something, I'm sorry if I broke up there for a second. Um, I, did, I did make it fair game to ask about costumes, um, and this falls under the spirit of that. Porgy McClellan wants to know where John got his tie clip. Oh, thank you for noticing the details. Um, 
Gosh, I honestly don't recall. I'm sure it was some strip mall somewhere long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Looks great. Um, okay. So, um, Penny Maldonado asks, can you explain what an effective comment consists of? Sometimes it seems that the public needs to have a level of knowledge to be able to analyze the alternatives that supersedes the agency writing it. Is this truly public comment or are the views of the individual dependent on their environmental knowledge to be successfully received? That is a great question. Um, and, and Penny, I'll, I'll say that although we have um, lawyers and scientists on staff at the Wyoming Outdoor Council, um, the level of technical detail has really gotten to be so precise in a lot of these documents that we have ended up needing to hire outside consultants on various um, topics, hydrology, uh, wildlife biology, groundwater resources, because it's true that in order to really know whether what you're reading in environmental impact statement is not only accurate, but, but an adequate amount of information, sometimes that's really beyond us. And so I certainly empathize with members of the public who feel the same way. Um, the other aspect is that over the last 10 or 15 years or so, agencies have become um, a little bit disparaging of, of just a typical public comment kind of expressing a desire to see some kind of management on the landscape. And instead, they really push this idea of comments being substantive. And I think that that is a real disservice. Um, and that does uh, discourage participation because those documents can be really intimidating. And that folks should be able to express opinions about what they want to see on our public lands um, without having advanced degrees in various topics. Um, at the same time, and, and I guess I'm, I'm plugging um, not just the Wyoming Outdoor Council, but other conservation groups doing this kind of work, um, we do at least know what we don't know. And if we don't have the expertise, we do often um, look for experts who can, who can give us a, a rundown um, of an analysis. So I think it's important if you do deeply care about an issue and you're feeling intimidated to find a group um, that's putting resources into that um, hard look. I would also suggest that um, that the agencies may may appreciate your local input as you know somebody who actually uses the land even more so than a conservation organization that might be statewide or national and have less uh, direct experience. And so while um, comments are getting increasingly more technical and hard to decipher. Uh, I think, especially in the aggregate, lots of comments from the community of users on, on a given landscape can, uh, can sway the agencies. Um, it looks like from the chat that a few people had a question basically along these lines. Um, so I'm glad that we got to that. Margie asks, um, what qualifies as substantive? She just wants to make sure that she is substantive. I'm not sure there's an actual definition. Um, John, correct me if I'm wrong. But often what they're, they're looking for is specificity. So instead of saying, I hate the idea of this project, um, I think that they would say, you know, what would help us more as decision makers trying to wade through how to, how to do this project right would be to have a concern for example, um, about certain resource. Um, so, so if your concern is about air quality, for example, um, really raising those specific questions, I think, can be helpful. Um, I also think it's it's important to um, to give a little bit of personal information about yourself, where you live, why you care. Um, even though these feel often like bureaucratic processes, there are real people at the other end um, who are required uh, to read all of the public comments and, and respond to them. And so treating 
agency staff um, in a professional and respectful way, and also just really telling them why you care. Um, I think, I guess, you know, that sounds Pollyanna, but I, I think we're all people, and I don't think that that hurts. Um, question from Jocelyn Moore. Um, will the Rock Springs RMP control the Occidental property if it's purchased by the state of Wyoming, or, or would BLM pass control of this acreage over to the Wyoming State Lands and Investments Board? Unfortunately, I think the details of that project are too nebulous for us to say right now. The plan would be that it would go into state control, though, correct? These would become, the idea is that the private lands would become state lands? Uh, I think that's right. Some of the private lands and then some, some mineral rights that have private surface. Yes. Um, okay, so here's a question, and I Googled to make sure I had a good sense of this, actually, so I cheated a little bit. Um, but um, an attendee asked, when was the first Earth Day? Was it before or after NEPA? And I believe the first Earth Day was April 1970, correct? So it would have been right after NEPA was signed, because NEPA passed in 69, I believe, right? Um, but then was signed into law in 1970. OK. Um, so I don't, I actually don't know what the relationship was around, if there was any organizing around Earth Day that was connected to advocacy on NEPA. So I just wanted to ask that to see if either of you knew. I'm not sure um, if they were directly connected, but this is in the context of the American environmental movement where a lot of our national environmental laws were passed to the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, um, acts to clean up our, our toxic waste and things like that. And so I'm sure it was part of that, that groundswell. Makes sense. Um, Christy asks, what constitutes human issues um, in, an, in EA, an environmental assessment, that would escalate to the EIS, environmental impact statement? Um, that's a good question. And off the top of my head, I'm just, I'm kind of spitballing, but um, human health impacts, certainly. Um, but there, there, it's a broader, it's a broader scope. Um, it can be socioeconomic impacts. It can be quality of life um, impacts, uh, the way people use land recreationally um, or for different industries. Um, John, am I missing something? No, I think that's spot on. I was trying to think of an example, um, like uh, for, for a dam or something like that, if you were doing an EIS, you would have to look at potential impacts of flooding to downstream communities and things like that. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, that might be all the questions. Oh, no, we do have another question that's not related to NEPA. Um, but I will ask that question. If anybody has any final questions they want answered on NEPA, please type them in the chat or in the Q&A box. And in the meantime, Jocelyn also wants to know, how does she get her hands on one of these cool red desert maps? And I'm going to take the opportunity to showcase it a little bit because it is pretty cool. Oh, that's great. Um, Jocelyn, I believe that in one or two outdoor stores in Pinedale, those maps are available. I believe the Farson uh, Merck has copies of them, but a surefire way is to just send us an email. We have uh, many copies at the Wyoming Outdoor Council office in Lander, and we are happy to send you one. I'm just showcasing all the beautiful properties of this map. I know. I, yeah, I'll just brag one more minute about that map. Um, one of our board members did the cartography, and it's just really beautiful. And I, my family and I were out for three days two weekends ago, just kind of trying out the map. We had been to the Red Desert a bunch, but it was great. And then there's just, there's beautiful photographs and interpretive information um, on the other side. So it's just, it's a really great um, educational tool. We learned a lot um, and yeah, it's a great map. Um, Penny, has, um, Penny has a question. Is there any ongoing threat to the NEPA process?
Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, there is a threat to weaken the CEQ, the Council on Environmental Quality Regulations that are interpreting uh, NEPA. Right now, under the current CEQ regs, um, agencies have to look at the direct, indirect, and cumulative impacts of their actions. Uh, that's a little nerdy, but what that means is they don't just have to look at the specific impacts of a specific project. They have to consider it in the context of the projects around it over time. And the proposal to weaken those regulations would uh, remove agency analysis of indirect and cumulative impacts. So it would very, it would narrow um, their analysis significantly. There's all, it, it seems like there are always um, efforts, congressional efforts um, or administrative efforts, depending on who's in the White House, to speed up or make the NEPA pro process more quote unquote efficient. Um, and while John described earlier, these processes do take a while, um, these are public resources. And so it's really important to um, take the time to get it right, to give people an opportunity to add their voice. Um, it's, it's maybe not the most um, fast moving of processes, but neither is democracy. <laughs> and it's really better than the alternative, um, which would be ill-informed um, and potentially really harmful actions that then all of us have to live with. Um, so yes, there is this new um, proposal from the administration to, to weaken NEPA and, and we are opposing that as our groups across the country and, and really hoping that um, the time runs out on this administration to do any permanent damage. All right, I think that was our final question. There was a request for um, the NEPA text, which if you have your chat box open, John Rader has helpfully put a link in there at whitehouse.gov you can find. Um, the other thing I'll plug is that in addition to hopefully getting on our mailing list um, and thank you for attending this evening, that we are all pretty accessible. And so while I can't claim to be a great NEPA specialist, um, I am happy any of us who participated tonight um, are very happy and certainly I think all three lawyers would be happy to answer your questions. So as you try to navigate this process, as you learn more, um, as you get interested in any particular resource management planning process or you see something on the Bureau of Land Management's e-planning site that looks interesting to you, please reach out to us. Um, a lot of our work is really um, hearing from folks and hearing input um, and, and people asking for help. And then we get involved and try to offer as much support as we possibly can. So thanks to you um, for your time. Always feel free to reach out to us, reach out to me if you have any questions about this webinar. And thanks for joining us and letting us get a little bit silly with some puppets. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you, goodbye. Have a good evening. You too.